Hi and welcome to part two of Girls in Love by Jacqueline Wilson, continuing from Three Boyfriends. I hear this voice going on about a boy on holiday in Wales, a boy I kept seeing, but I didn't get a chance to talk to him until we met up in a romantic ruined castle one wild and windy day. We literally fell into each other's arms, I say. Well, it's sort of true. I tell them he's called Dan. They immediately ask how old he is. He's not as old as your Liam, Nad, I say. That's true too. So how old is he, Magda insists. He's 15, I say. He will be in three years time. What does he look like? Is he dishy? What sort of clothes does he wear? Magda persists. I abandon all attempt at truth. He's very good looking, blonde. His hair's lovely. It sort of comes forward in a wavy fringe, just a little bit tousled. He's got dark eyes, a really intense brown. He's got this way of looking at you. He's just a real dream. His clothes are very casual, nothing too posy. Jeans, uh, a sweatshirt. Still, that's just what he was wearing on holiday. It's so unfair. We didn't meet up properly until right at the end, and yet somehow, when we started talking, it was like we'd known each other forever, you know? Did he kiss you? Nadine asks. We didn't get a chance to kiss. Worst luck. We were with my stupid family nearly all the time. We did manage to steal off together at a picnic, but just as Dan was getting really romantic, eggs came chasing over to us and started pestering us, and that was it. Honestly. What are you getting all passionate about, Eleanor? Oh, God. It's Mrs. Henderson in her tracksuit, jogging off to the gym. I look down at my lap, going all pink, trying desperately hard not to giggle. Her boyfriend, says Magda. Surprise, surprise, says Mrs. Henderson. She sighs. You girls seem to discuss little else. You've all got one-track minds. Many thousands of determined, intelligent women fought battles throughout this century to broaden your horizons, and yet you'd sooner sit there babbling about boys than concentrate on your all-round education. You said it, Mrs. Henderson, says Magda, unwisely. Well, you three are going to have to curtail your cosy little chat and do a detention tomorrow because you've been so carried away by your enthralling conversation that you failed to notice the bell for afternoon school went five minutes ago. Now, get to your lessons at once. We jump to it. We get told off all over again when we get to English. It isn't fair. I quite like English. It's about the only thing I'm any good at, apart from art. But now, Mrs. Madley glares at us and goes on and on, and we get divided up. I have to sit right at the front. We're doing Romeo and Juliet this year. Everyone thinks it's dead boring. Privately, I quite like Shakespeare. I like the way the words go, though I don't understand half of it. Certainly the beginning bit's dull. But when I flip through the book and find the first Juliet part, it gets much more interesting. Juliet is only 13, nearly 14, so she'd be in year 9 too. As far as I can work out, her mother and her nurse are keen for her to get married. I sit wondering what it would be like to be married at 13 in Juliet's day. It would be fun, as long as you were rich enough to have someone pay the mortgage on your Italian mansion and loads of servants to spruce up your medieval Versace frocks and deliver your pizzas to your marital four-poster. Mrs. Madley suddenly shouts my name, making me jump. You not only come to my lesson ten minutes late, Eleanor Allard, but you obviously aren't paying the slightest attention now you're here. What on earth is the matter with you? She's in love, Mrs. Madley, says Magda. She can't ever keep her mouth shut. Mrs. Madley groans in exasperation while the whole class collapses. Looks like I'm in serious trouble again. I stare wildly at the page in front of me. I spot a line at the top that looks dead appropriate. Under love's heavy burden do I sink. I quote, sending myself up. Mrs. Madley is wrong-footed. She even looks mildly amused. Well, take care, and don't sink too far, Eleanor. Look what happens to these star-crossed lovers at the end of the play. Now, girls, settle down, and let us all concentrate on Shakespeare. I decide I'd better concentrate too, so I don't really have time to plan what on earth I'm going to say going home from school with Magda and Nadine. In Math's last lesson, there's no point my trying to concentrate because I can't figure out any of it. So I sit nibbling my thumbnail, worrying about this boyfriend situation. When I was little, I used to suck my thumb a lot. Now, when I'm ultra anxious, I find I have to, well, find a little weenie suck and chew just to calm myself. I wondered if smoking might have the same effect. Not in a classroom situation, obviously, but when Magda shared a packet of Bentons with me, I felt so sick and dizzy by the time I lit up my second one, it put me off for life. I have to sort out what I'm going to say about Dan. I think of his blonde hair and dark brown eyes. Only, that's the boy I saw this morning on the way to school. I don't even have, a, have, even have a clue who he is. I just started describing him when Magda and Nadine asked all those questions. I couldn't tell them what the real Dan looks like, or they'd crease up laughing. Oh God, why did I open my big mouth? I was like some demented fairy godmother waving a wand over nerdy little boy Dopey Dan in Wales and turning him into the golden dream I saw this morning. Magda and Nadine believe it all too. I practically believe it. 
I've always had this crazy habit of making things up. It was mostly when I was little, like after my mum died. It was so horrible and lonely that I kept trying to pretend she wasn't really dead, that if I could only perform all these really loopy tasks, like go all day without going to the toilet, or stay awake an entire night, then suddenly she'd come walking into my bedroom, and it would all be a mistake. Someone else's mother had died, not mine. Sometimes when I was lying awake, holding my eyelids open, I'd almost believe she was really there, standing my, by my bed, leaning over, ready to give me a cuddle. So close I could actually smell her lovely, soft, powdery scent. Even after I gave up on those daft tricks, I didn't give up on my mother. I felt she still had to be around for me. I talked to her inside my head, and she talked back, saying all the ordinary mum things, telling me to be careful crossing the road, and to eat up like a good girl. And when I went to bed, she'd chat to me about my day, and she'd always say, nighty nighty, and I'd whisper, pyjama pyjama. I did that long after Dad married Anna. She said some of that stuff too, but it wasn't the same at all. I used to hate Anna, simply because she wasn't mum. I'm older now. I can see it's not really Anna's fault. She's okay sometimes, but she's still not my mum. So what would mum say? This is the awful bit. I can still make mum say all this stuff to me, but it's the old stuff that I needed to hear when I was little. My made-up mum can't seem to get her head around the idea that I'm big now, big enough to want a boyfriend, only I haven't got one, and yet I've told my two best friends I have. Tell them the truth, Ellie, mum says firmly, her voice suddenly loud and clear. She sounds so real I actually look around the classroom to see if anyone else can hear her. I know mum is right. In fact, I even work out how to do it. I shall say I was just teasing them, playing a silly joke to see how much they'd swallow. I'll say I did meet a boy called Dan on holiday, but I'd say what he's really like. I'll even tell them about the gorgeous blonde bloke on the way to school. I'll draw a cartoon for them, the real Dan and me with my wand turning him into the dream boat. They'll think it's funny. Well, maybe more funny peculiar than funny ha-ha, but they're used to me being a bit weird. They're still, they'll still like me, even though they'll think I'm nuttier than ever. I'll tell them on the way to the bus stop. Then it'll be over and everything will go back to normal. Except Nadine really has got a boyfriend, this Liam. Unless, could she have made him up too? Nadine and I used to play all these pretend games together. She was always great at making things up. That's why I always wanted her to be my friend. Oh, what a hoot if Nadine's been fibbing too. I really wouldn't put it past her. But when we come out of school at the end of lessons and Magda is asking me more about Dan and I'm all set to say my piece, though my throat's dry with nerves and I feel incredibly silly, Nadine suddenly stops dead and gasps. Nadine? We stare at her. She's blushing. I can't get used to seeing Nadine's snowy skin shine salmon pink. Nadine, what's up? I say. Magda is quicker than me. She's seen what Nadine is staring at. Not what? Who? Wow, says Magda. Is he Liam? Nadine swallows. Yes. Oh God, what am I going to do? I'm in my school uniform. Well, he knows you go to school, but I look such a burk in uniform. I can't let him see me like this. Nadine dodges behind me, dugging right, du ducking right down. Walk backwards into school, Ellie, she hisses. Don't be so nuts, Nadine, says Magda. Look, he's seen you anyway. How do you know? Nadine mutters, still hiding behind me. Because he's waving like crazy over in our direction, and he's not waving at me, worse luck. He's really gorgeous, says Magda. He is. He's tall. He's got dark hair and very dark eyes. He looks hip in his skimpy black top and black jeans. He's the sort of guy who seems totally out of our class, like my blonde dreamboat. But Liam isn't pretend. He's real. And he's still waving at Nadine. She steps sideways round me, pink and pretty. It's as if she's a whole new person who I hardly know. She waves back, an odd little waggle of her fingers, her elbow tucked into her side. Then she runs over to the wall where he's waiting. I can't believe it, Magda mutters. He's so yummy. What does he see in Nadine? Magda, don't be such a bitch, I say primly but she's only saying out loud what I'm thinking. I feel as if I've been in a race with Nadine, and I always thought I'd win, but now she's forged ahead and left me behind. Come on, Ellie, let's go and say hello, says Magda. No, we can't butt in. Of course we can, says Magda, shoving me sharply in their direction. She runs one hand through her hair, fluffing it up and undoes the top button of her school blouse. Hey, Nadine, she calls, wiggling across the playground towards them. I stand foolishly, not sure whether to follow. I edge towards them as if I'm playing grandmother's footsteps. Nadine is sitting on the wall beside Liam. Magda is standing in front of them, one hand on her hip. She's chatting away like crazy, but it doesn't look as if Liam is paying her much attention. Nadine isn't saying much. She's looking down, hiding behind her hair. Oh, and this is my other friend, Ellie, she mumbles when I get near. What's wrong with her voice? She sounds all wet and whispery. Hello, I say awkwardly. 
Liam gives me a curt nod and turns back to Nadine. You look cute in the uniform, she sa he says. I look awful, Nadine protests. What are you doing here anyway? I finished early at college, so I thought I'd see if I could spot you amongst all your little school girly chums. So come on, let's go for a walk or something. Okay, says Nadine, swinging her legs over the wall. Liam raises his eyebrows and she giggles stupidly. Bye then, Nadine. Bye, Liam, says Magda. She waves. He doesn't bother to respond. Well, says Magda, staring after them. So we're the little school girly chums, eh, Ellie? She's so different with him, I mutter. He doesn't exactly get 10 out of 10 in the charm stakes, says Magda. I hope Nadine knows what she's doing. He's ever so old for her. I don't like him, I say. Neither do I. Though, if he'd liked me more, I might feel more positive, says Magda, laughing. That's one thing about Magda. She might be a real scheming bitch at times, but she's always honest about it. Oh, well, Ellie, I'll walk with you to the bus stop, eh? She links her arm in mine. There's a whole crowd of Anderson boys at the bus stop. Our school is Anderson High School too, but they're entirely separate, across the road from each other on separate sites. One school for girls, one school for boys. Twin schools for separate sexes. Only most of the Anderson boys are so awful it's depressing. The little ones are just like animals, yelling and kicking and bashing each other with their school bags. Their idea of sophisticated humour is farting. Come to think of it, the year nines go in for that a lot too. They are all revolting, each and every one. The year 10s and 11s are almost as bad, though I suppose there are a few possibles. One of these possibles is at the bus stop. He's Greg, someone. I suppose he's quite good looking, but he's, he's got red hair that he hates, so he puts heaps of gel on it to make it as dark as he can. If you were ever in a, ever in a clinch with Greg and you ran your fingers through his hair, it would be like dabbling in cold chip fat. Not a happy thought. Magda's never given him a second glance before, but suddenly she bounces up to him. Hi, Greg. Hey, how's things? Did you have a good holiday? Pretty dire having to come back to this old dump, eh? And look at all this homework first day back. Can you believe it? See how heavy my bag is. She thrusts it at Greg. He staggers, blinking rapidly. It's not the heaviness of Magda's bag. It's the heaviness of her approach. I don't think she's ever said one word to him before. He turns almost as red as his hair and looks totally idiotic. Magda gazes at Belisha Beacon Boy as if he's a Keanu or a Brad. She sighs and stretches her arms, making out their aching. This action has an amazing effect on her school blouse. The buttons strain. Greg positively glows. A foul little gang of year eights are ogling too, nudging each other and making disgusting comments. Magda shakes her head at them. She makes a pithy comment that indicates they have been exercising their own arms more than somewhat. And then she looks back at Greg. Her blue eyes have a positively light house beam. You're not any good at maths, are you, Greg? I'm useless. She's not, actually. I'm the one who can't even add up correctly using a calculator. Nadine's not much better. Magda is always the girl who does our maths homework, but now she's acting like she's got candy floss for her brain. I'm okay at maths, actually, says Greg. What's the problem, then? Oh, it's ever so complicated, says Magda. And look, isn't that the bus coming? I don't get on the bus. I I'm just here with my friend. Look, Greg, do you ever go to the McDonald's near the market? Sure I do. Well, how about if we meet up there? Half seven? Something like that? I'll bring my stupid maths with me and see if you can make me understand it, okay? Yeah, sure, says Greg. Half seven, right? It's a date, says Magda, retrieving her school bag and giving Greg a dazzling smile. She turns to me and winks. So now Magna's got herself a boyfriend too, in less than five minutes. Greg waves after her as he gets on the bus. I wonder if he might sit next to me as I'm Magda's friend, but he barges straight past and sits with some other Anderson boys who have already got on. He's talking rapidly, obviously showing off that he scored with Magda. I sit all by myself. I'm starting to feel seriously depressed. So I didn't tell Magda and Nadine I was making it all up. I didn't get a chance, did I? And Nadine has got a real boyfriend, and now Magda has got one too, just like that. Why can't I chat someone up the way she can? I gaze round the bus in desperation. There are two nerdy year 10 Anderson boys sitting across the way from me, earnestly discussing some stupid sci-fi stuff. They look like beings from another planet themselves, but I'm so desperate I'll try anything. I bare my teeth at them in a big cheesy grin. They reel back as if I'm a rabid dog about to bite. I cover my teeth and cower in my seat. It's no use. I'm not like Magda. Oh God. I feel so fed up. I'm never ever going to get a boyfriend. No boy in the entire world is ever going to fancy me. No, I am wrong. When I get home, there is a letter waiting for me. Four in the family. Dear Ellie, hello, it's me, Dan. Sorry this is such jiggly writing. 
I'm scribbling this going home in the car and various sprogs keep jogging me and my mum is driving and she's a total maniac. She does a 90 mile an hour dash down the motorway and then when one of the kids starts screaming for a wee, she screeches to a halt on the hard shoulder in seconds so that we practically hurtle through the windscreen. This is not romantic subject matter for a love letter. Okay, shall I try to be romantic? I should make up a super romantic fable about a fair maiden languishing in a tower being rescued by a handsome knight. A Welsh fable set in a Welsh castle like the Mabindongian, that's uh, those old Welsh tales I told you about. They're written down in the white book and a uh, red book. Well, this isn't a book. It's a scrappy letter and you're not fair. You're dark and I'm not handsome. You can say that again. I, I know you think I'm all nerdy and nutty. Well, I'm wordy as well as nerdy. And okay, who cares if I'm nuts? I I'm nuts about you. I wish we didn't live so far away, but you can come on a visit to my place any time. If you don't mind being surrounded by all my stupid siblings, or I can come and visit you. Hint, hint. Love from Dan. P.S. It was truly great meeting you. Honestly, he is nuts. If only he were older and not so daft and good looking. Who's it from then? asked Anna, stirring soup at the stove. She tastes it delicately. More pepper, eggs, carefully. Eggs likes cooking. He even helps make Eggs Benedict his namesake. Well, he's called Benedict. Anna's slightly poncy choice, but no one's ever called him that. He started off as Baby Benny, and for the last two years he's been eggs. Possibly pickled, sometimes scrambled, often bad. It's just some silly scribble from Dan, I say, stuffing the letter into my pocket. Anna re re raises her eyebrows. I thought you'd made a hit there. For God's sake, Anna, he's only 12, don't be crazy. I like that, Dan. Oh great, is he your boyfriend? Eggs burbles, shaking Pepper enthusiastically. Careful, Eggs, just a pinch, says Anna, catching hold of his wrist. Pinch, 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 Eggs giggles, pretending to pinch her arm. Idiot boy, says Anna fondly, turning him upside down and tickling his exposed tummy. I'm going to do my homework, I say. I usually hang around the kitchen for a bit first, but I don't particularly enjoy watching Anna and Eggs together. It always makes me feel weird, like I was jealous or something. Not that I want to play about with Eggs in the slightest, and I certainly don't want Anna tickling me. She'd fall flat on her back if she tried to pick me up anyway. I weigh much more than her already, even though she's heaps taller. Anna never tried any romping, tickling, cuddling, mumsy stuff with me. I'm too old and she's too young. Of course, there's far more of an age gap between Anna and Dad. He's nearly old enough to be her dad. He teaches art and Anna was a student at his college. Dad didn't teach her. She did textiles. She used to work part-time as a design consultant, but that firm went bust, so she's been looking for a new opening for ages. Dad still teaches at the college. The students haven't gone back yet, but he's at home. He's out at some college meeting, nevertheless. Hang on a tick, Ellie, says Anna. I don't know when your dad's going to get back. You know what he's like, but I'm supposed to be starting this Italian evening class tonight, so you wouldn't be an angel and put eggs to, be be eggs to bed for me. Look, like I said, I've got all this homework. I whine for a while, and then I change tack and point out that the other girls get paid for being a babysitter. Cheek! I'm not a baby, Eggs intervenes. Why is it babysitter anyway? They don't sit on the baby, do they? Shut up, Eggs, or I'll take great delight in sitting on you, I say. I do agree in the end, very, very reluctantly, though I can't see why Anna's making such a point of starting up this Italian evening class. It's not as if you're going to romp in Rome or flourish in Florence. We will get wet in Wales, as always. She gets Eggs all bathed and ready for bed after supper, so all I'm supposed to do is su supervise his last wee and stuff him into bed. Ha <laughs> ha! He starts capering about like a monkey, and whenever I catch him, he screams and giggles and squirms. When Dad comes in at last, Eggs runs down the hall to him, yelling at the top of his voice. Hey, hey, why aren't you in bed, Mr. Eggs and Bacon, says Dad. He looks at me reproachfully. You shouldn't get him so excited before he goes to bed, Ellie. He'll be too worked up to sleep. Like it's my fault. That's the thanks I get. And it's dead annoying because Eggs does quieten down with Dad. He snuggles up on his lap and Dad reads him a little bear story. Egg smiles angelically and gently strokes each picture of little bear in his finger. There, my little bear, looks actually. Well, they're my books, actually. I can't ever remember Dad reading them to me. Not when I was all sleepy and snuggled up like that. What's up, Ellie? Dad says stubbornly. Are you sulking? No, I'm not sulking. I'm just sitting here. There's no crime in that, is there? Read, Dad, Eggs insists. Don't talk to smelly Ellie. Eggs, says Dad, but he chuckles. Suddenly, I can't stand either of them. It's suffocating even being in the same room as them. I stalk off to my bedroom and put on some music. Loud. Suppose I ought to make a start on all this horrible homework, but I catch sight of myself in the mirror. My hair looks awful, sort of exploding in all directions. 
So I have to brush it into submission and experiment with different hairstyles. I can't scrunch it up into a little top knot so it looks neater, almost okay, but then it makes my face look so much fatter. Oh God, my face is fatter. It's like a huge great white beach ball and I'm getting a spot on my chin and there's a little one on my nose too, a pink and white polka dot beach ball. I can't stand spots. Anna says I should never ever touch them, but it's okay for her. She's got this incredible English rose skin. I don't think she's ever had a spot in her life. I have a little squeezing session. It doesn't help. I feel so ugly. No wonder I haven't got a boyfriend. No one will ever want to go out with me, apart from Dan. And he's so short-sighted, even he would probably run away from me screaming if he polished up his specs and saw me properly. I pick up his letter and read it again. Dad suddenly comes barging into my room. Dad, you're not supposed to come into my room without knocking. I did knock. You just didn't hear me because of that awful row. Turn it down. I've just put eggs to bed. Eggs, 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 eggs. I see them as a row of Humpty Dumpty sitting on a wall. I tip them off one at a time. Smash, 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 smash. Oh, of course. We mustn't disturb the boy wonder, I say, switching off my CD player. Okay. Happy now? Total silence so his little lordship can not nod off in peace. I didn't say you had to turn it off altogether, says Dad. What's up with you? Ellie, you're so prickly all the time now. He comes closer, tugging at his beard the way he always does when he's worried. Hey, what have you done to your face? It's bleeding. Haven't done anything. I say, covering my chin with my hand. Now, would you mind leaving me alone so I can get on with my homework? That's not homework. It's a letter. Who's it from, eh? It's my letter, Dad. I say, crumpling it up. Not quite quickly enough. He sees the end bit. Love from Dan. It's a love letter, he says. No, it isn't. So why on earth? Well, who on earth is this Dan? When did you get, a, get yourself a boyfriend, Ellie? I haven't got a boyfriend. Will you just mind your own business, please? I say, stuffing the stupid letter in my shirt pocket. When Dad's gone, I sigh deeply and put my head in my arms. I think about crying, but actually fall asleep. I wake up with a stiff neck. I find I can't sleep when I go to bed. Dad puts his head around the door when he comes upstairs to bed himself. Are you asleep, Ellie? He whispers. Yes. Anna told me about the boyfriend. He's that weird brainy kid in the anorak, right? Wrong, wrong, wrong. He is not my boyfriend. Oh God, I'm getting so sick of this. I say, putting my head under the pillow. Okay, okay, calm down, sorry. Anna says I shouldn't tease you, Ellie. I stay underneath the pillow. There's a pause. Then I feel a slight pressure as he bends forward. Nighty, nighty, Dad whispers, kissing the pillow instead of me. I wait, and then I whisper, pyjama, pyjama. I take the pillow off my face, but Dad's gone out of the room already. I still can't sleep. I hang onto the pillow for something to cuddle. I wish I'd kept some of my cuddly toys from when I was little. I had this blue elephant called Nelly, and when I was eggs age, I always had to lug her around with me. I talked to her constantly, as if she were real. So you didn't just get me then. You got an Ellie and Nelly package. I also had a panda called Bartholomew, and a giraffe called Mabel and a big rag doll with orange hair called Marmalade. I had really grown out of them all by the time Eggs was born, apart from Nelly. When Eggs started crawling, he ignored all his own new cuddly toys and always wanted mine. We once had a fight over Nelly. Eggs was screaming and screaming and wouldn't give her back. I could see it was a bit ridiculous, a girl like me wrestling with a toddler over a dirty toy elephant with a wonky trunk. But I wouldn't give up. And then Eggs was suddenly sick all over Nelly. I insisted he'd done it on purpose. I said Nelly was spoilt forever. My mother had made her for me when I was little. I bawled like a baby. Anna sluiced Nelly down and put her in the washing machine. She ended up a rather naff, pale mauve, and her stuffing went lumpy. She was still Nelly, but I insisted she was spoilt and threw her in the dustbin. I wish I hadn't. I wished it almost the minute the dustbin dustmen carted her off. I know it's totally mad, but I still sometimes think of her now, lying amongst rotting Chinese takeaways and soggy tea bags on some stinking rubbish tip, her trunk crumpled in despair. I threw all my other toys out when I redecorated my room, wanting the cha to change everything, to stop being that sad, silly, dreamy, fat girl. I wanted to remodel a new shiny hip version of Ellie to match my new room. I painted it bright blue with red furniture and yellow curtains, primary colours for a very secondary style. I tried to be bright and snappy and cheerful to match, but I couldn't keep it up. In fact, right now, I feel so dark and dreary and dismal. I feel my matching habitat would be down a drain. I clutched the pillowcase. When I was younger, I used to have Nadine sleep over at my house at least once a week. We'd never bother with camp beds and sleeping bags. We'd just snuggle up together in my bed. Nadine's not the cuddliest of girls. Her elbows are sharp and she's very wriggly, but it was great fun all the same. We'd make up ghost stories, so gross and gory that I'd have nightmares when we eventually got to sleep. 
But that was okay too, because I could hang on to Nadine and feel the knobs on her spine as I cuddled up against her, her long hair tickling my face. Only now Nadine has got Liam to cuddle. I still can't believe it, even though I've met him now. I wonder how she got on with him on their walk. And Magda, Magda with Greg. Nadine and Liam and Magda and Greg. Ellie and no one at all. I drift off to sleep at long last. I dream. Ellie and Dan. Not the real Dan. The pretend boy. The one with blonde hair and brown eyes. He waits for me outside school and we go off for a walk together down by the river. He holds my hand while we're walking along the street. But when we get to the secluded riverside, he pulls me close. His arms go around me. He whispers lovely things. He lifts my hair and kisses my neck. My ears, my mouth. We're kissing properly. It's so beautiful. We're lying on the mossy bank, entwined. I am his, and he is mine, and he whispers that he loves me, that he loved me from the moment we first set eyes on each other, when he dodged round and parked ca a parked car, and we nearly collided. And I whisper that I love him too. I love you, I whisper, and I wake up. I've never had such a vivid dream. I can still see the dappled sunlight on our skin, smell the honey musk of, of his chest, hear the beat of his heart, feel the warmth of his body. That is where I am, where I want to stay. I'm a stranger in this banal world of bathroom and breakfast. I won't say a word as I sip coffee and spoon cornflakes. We sit at the table, Dad, Anna, Eggs and me. Four sides of the table, four members of a family, but they don't seem to have any connection with me whatsoever. Dad is saying something to me, but I'm, I'm not listening. It seems so strange that the only reason I'm sitting at this table is that the eight pints of blood in this body are similar to mine. He's just a plump middle-aged guy with an embarrassing haircut and beard way too old to wear, that silly t-shirt. That small boy with the yelping laugh, choking on his cornflakes, has even less to do with me. The calm woman in her white shirt, nothing at all. She's saying something about me missing the bus if I'm not careful, and she's right. It's there at the top, when I'm only halfway down the road. I could try running, but I don't want my skirt to ride up even further, and besides, maybe I don't really want to catch the boring old bus. I can always walk to school, just in case. So I walk, past the bus stop, down the street, round the corner. The parked car's not there. He's not there either. Yes, he is. That's him, right down at the end, walking towards me. My dream is still so real. It's as if I know him, as if we went for that walk together and we're in each other's arms down by the river. He's getting nearer, wearing a blue denim shirt today. He looks great with his colouring. He's looking straight ahead. Is he looking at me? Looking for me? What if he dreamt about me too? What if he somehow dreamt the way, well, the very same dream? I walk on and he walks on too. I can see his features now, his brown eyes, his straight nose, his sweet mouth. He's smiling. He's smiling at me. I shall smile too, a deeply significant smile to show that we share a secret. Hi, he says, a few paces away. Hi, to me? Is he really talking to me? He can't be. My head swivels to see if there's someone standing behind me. No one. It's me. Oh God, I feel such an idiot. I try to say hi back, but my throat is a sandy Sahara, so dry it comes out as a croak. And then he's passed. He's walking on. I've lost it. I've lost my chance. He must think me a complete fool, only capable of frog talk. I'm late for school again. Mrs. Henderson gives me a detention. Another one. Two in two days. Mrs. Henderson suggests that I seem to be going for some sort of record. Not a wise move, Eleanor, she adds threateningly. I don't know what to do. I'm not fussed about Hockey Sticks Henderson. It's me. I think I'm really going mad, because now I'm in school and I'm breathing in the familiar smell of rubber trainers and canteen chip fat and body shop scent and clearasil. My dream is fading fast. I was starting to believe the dream was real, that the blonde boy and I were really involved. I've got to stop this fast. I've got to tell Nadine and Magda that I made it all up. But I still don't get a word in edgeways, not even at lunchtime on our steps. Nadine goes on about Liam, Liam and Liam. She's inked a whole series of love hearts all the way up her arm. She'll give herself blood poisoning if she's not careful. It's as if she's dyed her brain with his name too, because he's all she can talk about. Not that they seem to talk at all. He's barely said anything to her so far. They just skive off and snog, basically. Which is a little too basic, if you ask me. Well, I don't ask you. I didn't ask you, Nadine snaps. Magda says that Greg does too much talking. He never stops. He showed her how to work out the maths homework, although she already knew perfectly how, well how to do it. And then she started giving her tip, he, he started giving her tips on science into the bargain. How about a few tips on human biology? Magda suggested on their way home. But he was too thick to take her up on the offer. He might be dead brainy, but he's brain dead when it came to physical relationships, obviously. It's not necessarily obvious, Magda retorts. I've just got to give him time. Redheads are known for their tempestuous natures. You're ever so picky about Liam and Greg, says Nadine. 
What's bugging you, eh, Ellie? Nothing's bugging me. You're not feeling just the teeniest bit left out, says Nadine. Certainly not. Well, she's probably fed up because her Dan is so far away and she can't see him, says Magda. If he even exists, says Nadine, staring at me very intently. I feel my heart pounding underneath my blouse. Nadine knows me so well. I hate the way her green eyes are gleaming. Oh, yes, he's a figment of my imagination, I say, staring at them both. I pause, then I feel in my skirt pocket and produce my crumpled letter. A figment of my imagination who somehow miraculously has managed to write to me, I say, flashing the letter in their faces. I cover up most of the words, but I show them the important part. Love from Dan. Five alive, but only just, and all dying of embarrassment and boredom. There's no way I can ever tell the truth now, so I'm stuck, treading in treacle, superglued into silence. I write back to Dan, mostly because I need him to write back to me again so I can show off his letters to Nadine and Magda, which is so mean. He writes back, and I write back, and he writes back, and so it goes on. They're just silly letters. He goes on about school and stuff and thinks, well, he thing, thinks he's reading and he tells a lot of corny old jokes. He puts love from Dan at the end each time, but they're not love letters. Dad says we're like Elizabeth Barrett and Robert Browning and Sniggers. They're dead poets. I mutter something ultra unpoetical along the lines that I wish Dad were dead too. Dad hears and gets knocked and says, I've completely lost my sense of humour. Anna surprisingly takes my side. She says Dad's crass and insensitive, and she's sick of it. So goodness knows how Ellie feels. Both Dad and I blink at her a bit. She doesn't usually rush to my defence. I think maybe she and Dad have had a row. I heard a lot of angry whispers last night after Anna got back from her evening class. I don't know what's going on with them. I don't know what's going on with me. I haven't even seen the dream, Dan, again. I caught the bus for a bit because Mrs Henderson was giving me so many detentions it was getting like I'd be stuck at school for a full 24 hours. But I chance walking today. I even hang around a second on the street where we met. Longer than a second, actually. More like 15 minutes. And I still don't get to see him. And I get another detention. It's quite companionable, actually, because Nadine is doing a detention too. It's just the two of us. Mrs Henderson makes us write out lines, would you believe, had to write out, I must pull myself together and try to be on time. I write it 100 times. I don't feel pulled together. I feel as if I'm flying apart. And I tried to be on time to see Dream Dan. I couldn't try any harder if I wrote it out on one, well, one million times. Nadine's line is shorter than mine, so even though she writes in an elaborate, twirly way, she still gets finished first. One hundred times, I must not be insolent. She came to school with this amazing love bite on her neck, a big blotch that looked impressively purple on her white skin. For God's sake, your Liam must have a mouth like a vacuum cleaner, said Magda. Well, Nadine's always had a thing about vampires, I said, trying to sound funny and flippant. I couldn't stop staring at Nadine's love bite. When we were little, we used to experiment, sucking on each other's arms to see what it felt like. When we got older, we agreed love bites were gross, and yet now Nadine had one right at the front of her neck so that it wasn't even hidden by her hair. I tried not to think of Liam doing it to her, but I couldn't help it. It made me feel so weird. Couldn't work out which I felt most disgusted or envious. Mrs Henderson's feelings were more straightforward. I think you need to go to the medical cupboard for a sticky plaster, Nadine, she said coldly. I don't want to look at that stupid mark on your neck. Surely you realise how silly it is to let someone do that to you. It's not exactly treating you with respect, is it? Let alone risking serious infection. Nadine scowled. Bet you're just jealous, she muttered. Not quietly enough. She got her detention too. Mrs Henderson leaves us to finish our lines while she goes off to supervise a hockey practice. Well, I've done my stupid lines, so I don't see why I can't go now, says Nadine, fidgeting. She said we had to wait till she came back. It's ridiculous. She's got no right to comment on what I do out of school hours, said Nadine, fingering the plaster covering her bite. What on earth did your mum and dad say when they saw it? Don't be mad. I wound this scarf right round my neck, right? I tell you, if they found out about Liam, they'd go seriously bananas. Nadine? What? She doesn't bother to look up. She gets a magazine out of her school bag and starts flipping through the pages. Nadine used to despise teen mags. She just read weird fanzines about her favourite bands and horror stories. But now she's reading this problem page as if her life depends on it. What's it feel like? You know, the love bite. Nadine shrugs. Did you want him to do it? Well, he wants to do it a lot more. And do you let him? Nadine wriggles. Well, sometimes. She hesitates. Look, keep this a secret, right? Don't even tell Magda. There's no one else in the room, but she still leans forward and then whispers. Nadine! I stay stunned. Well, what's wrong with that, eh? Says Nadine. Honestly, Ellie, you're such a baby. No, I'm not. 
Everyone does that with their boyfriends. Do they? Well, I take it you don't do it with Dan. The Dean looks at me sharply. I try to imagine such intimacy with both my Dans. I think of doing it with the dream Dan and the blood starts beating in my own neck. Then I think of doing it with the real Dan and I practically crack up laughing. What are you grinning about, says Nadine. So, you did fool around with your Dan. We'd certainly make fools of ourselves. Chance would be a fine thing, I mutter. We don't see each other, do we? Dan, real of course, has been nagging me to go and stay with him or invite him down to London. I keep putting him off with elaborate excuses, but it's getting a bit awkward. The whole situation is so difficult. I let out this long sigh. Do you really miss him, Ellie? Says Nadine softly. She puts her arm around me, crumpling her magazine. I snuggle into her, though I feel guilty. It's just, oh, I wish I could explain properly, Nad, I whisper. I know, says Nadine, though she doesn't. Look, things are a bit difficult with Liam and me too. We had this sort of row yesterday. Yeah? Because I won't, you know, go the whole way. I just don't feel ready to. And the, the magazines say you shouldn't do it till you're ready. Look, she reaches for the magazine and shows me this letter. Blah, blah, blah. So don't let your boyfriend do... Ooh. And if he complains that his tackle... What's his tackle? Like in Fishing Rod. We both get a fit of the giggles. No, you nutcase, it's his... You know. Oh, yes. Even I can work it out now. I carry on reading the letter. So does your Liam get all narked with you like the guy in the letter? He did yesterday. He said he'd been ever so patient and didn't I love him enough? And I said I loved him desperately, but I still didn't feel ready, right? And he said, if I wasn't ready now, I never would be. And what was the matter with me? Didn't I want our relationship to develop? The Dean's not giggling now. She's nearly in tears. Oh, Nad, he's acting like a right tackle. I hope she'll laugh, but a tear drips down her cheek. No, I, I can understand, Ellie. I mean, it's so frustrating for him. That's rubbish. Look, you don't have to do anything with him. You're only 13, for goodness sake. It's against the law. Yes, but nobody takes any notice of that. And all his other girlfriends have always done it. No bother. There you are. You don't want to be one of a whole long line of stupid girls. Honestly, Nadine, where's your brain? I can often, I've often been tempted to ask what that question myself, says Mrs. Henderson, walking through the door. The Dean shoves her mag under her desk and bends her head so that her hair hides her tear-stained face. Mrs. Henderson approaches. She's actually looking concerned. What's up, hmm? She says, in a different sort of voice altogether. I know you girls think I come from another planet, but maybe I can still help. What's the problem? The Dean fidgets behind her hair. I look down at my lap. Nadine, says Mrs. Henderson, are you upset about a boyfriend? Is that it? I suppose it's a reasonable, obvious guess, with Nadine's neck still purple. Nadine keeps quiet. It does help to talk things over, you know, says Mrs. Henderson. And no problem is unique. I'm sure I've had similar problems myself. I immediately get this amazing image in my head of Mrs. Henderson doing this particular thing to Mr. Henderson. I have to bite the sides of my cheek to stop myself shrieking with laughter. The Dean's shoulders shake. She's obviously got the same mental image. Thank God Mrs. Henderson doesn't twig the double, the trouble. Don't cry, Nadine, she says gently. Nadine gives a little gasp. Mrs. Henderson interprets it as a sob. Oh, come on now. Well, I can't force you to confide in me, but don't forget, I'm always here. Now, how far have you got with your lines? The Dean hands her page over, her head still bent. I must not be so insolent 100 times. Oh dear, I really ought to have given you another 100. I must learn to spell. Insolent, Nadine, but never mind. Off you go now, and you too, Eleanor. I hand in my own page, hoping she won't count the lines, as I'm still only at seventy-something. She scans them quickly, raises an eyebrow, and waves me away. Nadine and I hold our breath till we're safely down the corridor, and then we let out great whoops of laughter. At least it cheers Nadine up for a bit, but she still can't seem to see any kind of sense at all. The next day I have a private word with Magda. She's totally mental, says Magda. I know, but there's no way I can get through to her, I say. I'll have a go, says Magda. Well, do be ever so tactful, and don't let out that I said anything, eh? I say, but Magda isn't listening to me. Nadine, come over here. Ellie says you're going to do it with Liam, you silly cow. Practically every girl in the playground looks up and gawps. Magda, you and your big mouth, I say. I think it's you and your big mouth, Ellie, says Nadine. Thanks a bunch. Hey, don't be like that, says Magda, rushing over to her and putting her arm around her neck. Get off me, Magda. I just want to talk to you, Nadine. Yeah, but I don't want to talk about it, okay? We're mates, aren't we? But this isn't about you and me and Ellie. It's just to do with me and Liam. So you keep your nose out of it, okay? And you too, Ellie, says Nadine, and she stalks off by herself. Should we go after her, says Magda. We'll be wasting our time, I say miserably. I know Nadine too well. She'll never listen to either of us now. I feel I've really blown it. 
I betrayed Nadine's confidence and hadn't helped her in the slightest. She barely talks to either of us all day. When school is over, she goes rushing off to meet up with Liam, who's waiting for her by the wall. So let's have a word with him, eh? says Magda. No, you can't. And Nadine would kill us, I say. We don't get the chance anyway, because Nadine and Liam hurry away. It's cold, so Liam is wearing this incredibly black leather jacket. That is a seriously sexy jacket, Magda says wistfully. He might be a pig, but he sure looks good. Why can't Greg wear a leather jacket? He's got this naff zippy thing that's practically an anorak. How's it going with Greg anyway, I ask. Well, says Magda, and sighs. He doesn't want you to. Please, says Magda. Greg? No, he's okay. He's quite sweet, actually, but all we seem to do is talk homework and hang out at McDonald's. <sighs> Which reminds me, one of Greg's mates, Adam, is having a party this Saturday. His parents are away for the weekend, so they're planning a serious rave up. Want to come? I stare at her, heart beating. She mistakes my hesitation. Look, I know you and Dan are an item, and the last thing you wanted to meet someone new at a party. I mean, you've got a boyfriend. Oh, Magda, if you only knew. A party. I've never even been to a party before. Well, of course, I've been to parties. The little girly balloons and birthday cake kind. But I've never been to a party with boys. Please come, Ellie. Should be a laugh, if nothing else. Maybe I'll meet a new boyfriend. Greg's okay, but he's seriously lacking when it comes to street cred. His mates might have more potential. I don't know what to say, what to do. A serious rave up. No parents and boys, boys, boys. It sounds incredible. It sounds incredibly scary, I think. Well, drink. Drugs. I think bedrooms. I want to go. Maybe I'll meet a real boyfriend, one of Greg's mates, although perhaps they'll have girls already. Are you sure it wasn't be... Well, it won't be just a couple's party, I say. No, that's the point. This Adam is inviting along half year 11 at Anderson's, and most of them are totally uncoupled. They're desperate for more girls. Greg practically begged me to ask them along. I was thinking, who else shall we ask, eh? There doesn't seem much point in asking Nadine. Magda asks Chrissy, but she's already going to a party that night. She asks Jess, but she says it's not her kind of thing, thanks. She asks Anna, who says she'd give anything to go, but her dad would go bananas. Maybe my dad won't let me, I mumble. Rubbish, your dad seems really cool to me, says Magda. Dad always makes a fuss of Magda when she comes round to our house. I'll ask him for you if you like, says Magda. Okay. I don't really want her to. I don't know if I really want to go to this party. What will I wear? What will I say? What am I expected to do? What's up, says Magda. He knows you're going out with Dan, so you won't let any other boy try it on at the party, so he can't object, can he? Oh, help. I'll have to keep Magda away from Dad at all costs. Dad thinks it's hilariously funny that I write so much to the real Dan. He'll talk about him to Magda and she'll twig what he's really like. No, uh, leave Dad to me. I'll handle him, I say firmly. OK, I'll go to the party with you, Magda. You won't regret it, I promise, says Magda. I regret agreeing almost immediately. I tell Dad about the party, practically hoping he'll say no way. Anna is very doubtful and asks straight away if the parents are going to be there. And what about the drink-drug situation? And suppose there are gate crashes. Look, I don't want to be rude, but I wasn't asking you, Anna. I was asking Dad, I say, though I'm secretly glad she's pointed out all these objections. Hope Dad will take them all on board and agree it's out of the question. But he doesn't. Come off it, Anna. You're sounding positively middle-aged, he says. This is just some tame little party at a schoolboy's house. Why shouldn't Ellie go? And she'll be fine if Magda's going too. That kid knows what she's doing, all right. I don't give a damn about Magda. It's Ellie. Does she know what she's doing? Says Anna. We've got to credit her with some sense. You know enough not to do anything stupid, right, Ellie? You go to your party and have fun. I don't think you're being a very responsible parent, says Hannah. But then you're not famed for your responsibility, are you? What's that supposed to mean? Says Dad. I think you know, says Anna. I don't have a clue, says Dad. I don't have a clue either, but I leave them to have a row while I go up to my room. I get all my clothes and try on every single item. I look a mess in everything, fat, babyish, so utterly uncool that I despair. I'm still despairing on Saturday evening, even though Magda arrives early and gives me advice. Dress down. You look as if you're trying too hard if you dress up. Wear your jeans, not the cruddy ripped ones, the black. Okay, so that's my black jeans. Even though they're so tight, I shall be cut in two if I sit down. You won't be sitting down, babe. You'll be dancing, says Magda. She looks at my boots. Well, lumbering. She sees my face. Joe Kelly. I don't feel like laughing. I feel so fat I select my biggest baggiest t-shirt to wear with the jeans. No, 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 says Magda. Dress down, but also dress sexy. But I'm not. You don't have to be it. Just look it. Something little and tight on top. For God's sake, Ellie, yours are wonders without the bra. So if you've got it, flaunt it. I've never felt less like flaunting in my entire life. 
but I do as I'm told and put on an old purple t-shirt I wore when I was practically a little kid. It strains across my embarrassing chest. I look as if I'm wearing a giant rubber band, but Magda insists I look fine. She make, wait, makes me up with purple shadowed eyes to match the t-shirt and fusses that we haven't got deep purple nail varnish too. Dad is giving us a lift to this Adam's house. Magda is meeting Greg there. Dad winks approvingly at Magda, who is looking ultra cute in a little black skirt and a black and white top so short she shows her tiny waist whenever she moves. Dad stops winking and blinks when he sees me. Ellie, he says. What? I try, try, I try say trying to sound sh surly and defiant, but my voice cracks. Hmm, well, you look very... He looks over at Anna. Maybe this party isn't such a good idea after all, he says. I didn't realise it was going to be so grown up. Anna raises her eyebrows. Eggs jumps up onto the armchair. Look at me. See how tall I am. I'm a grown-up. I want to go to the party. He jumps up onto the arm and slips. Anna is kept busy quelling his yells and rubbing his sore bits. Dad sighs and offers us an arm each. Allow me to escort you, ladies, he says. He fusses in the car, grilling Magda about Greg and the other boys. He asks all Anna's questions about parents and drink and drugs and insists that he will be waiting outside at twelve to take us home. Like Cinderella, only ball gowns aren't what they used to be, he says, giving my t-shirt another nervous glance. He looks a little reassured when we draw up outside Adam's house, one of those cosy mock Tudor jobs with a little goldfish pond and a garden gnome in a little red plaster cap and matching boaties. There's a car parked in the drive. Ah, at least his parents are at home, says Dad. Cool subterfuge, Magda breathes in my ear. But guess what? It's not subterfuge at all. Adam's mum comes to the door in a pastel sweater and leggings, holding one of those big plastic plates with little sections for nuts and crisps and twiglets. Ah, you two are? I'm Magda and she's Ellie, says Magda faintly. And you're friends of Adam's? Well, I'm a friend of Greg and he's a friend of Adam, says Magda, and Ellie's my friend. I don't feel like being Magda's friend. Not after tonight. This is not a rave up. This is a terrible, embarrassing non-event. Adam is a boy who looks almost as young as Dan, even though he's in year 11. He's a little weedy what's it with an extremely protuberant ap Adam's apple, appropriate, which bobs up and down when he talks. For a long, terrible while, it's just Adam and Magda and me in the living room, with Adam's mum bustling in and out, offering us party nibbles and some ghastly punch that's got about one tot of red wine to every gallon of fruit juice. Damp shreds of mascherino cherry and tinned mandarin lodge against my teeth whenever I try to take a drink. Adam hisses that his parents decided against their weekend break because his dad has a shocking cold. We hear frequent explosive sneezing from upstairs. I don't think there are going to be any heavy bedroom sessions tonight somehow. Greg turns up eventually. Magda gives him a hard time, whispering furiously in his crimson ear. One more boy arrives half an hour later. He's clutching a can of lager and boasts that he's had a few already. He keeps belching. Adam finds this funny and swigs from the can too when his mum's out of the room. I would sooner go out with Dan than these two. I would sooner go out with eggs. Why doesn't anyone else come? After endless awful ages, there's another knock and it sounds as if there's a whole crowd of boys outside. But when Adam's mum goes to the door, there's a whole load of spluttering and mumbled excuses and someone says they've come to the wrong house and they all charge off. So we are left. Five of us. We are the party. And I don't drink and I don't take drugs and I don't dance and I don't go up to a bedroom of a boy. I don't even talk to a boy. I just sit there at the first and worst party of my life. And that is where we will leave part two of Girls in Love by Jacqueline Wilson. I'll be back soon with the next part of this fantastic story and lots more stories and videos coming your way very soon. If you'd like to subscribe or hit a like, that's always appreciated. Thanks for listening, guys. Bye bye.